Hi again, everyone. This is lecture 22, Emergency uh, Preparedness and Response. So I've gone back and forth a little bit on this topic. And um, in the last lecture, lecture 21, I promised you a shorter lecture. And I'm going to try to keep to that promise. Uh, but I've kind of changed. Uh, I mean, the, the topics and how I'm presenting them are kind of changing in real time here. Uh, based on what we're going through with this pandemic and the preparation for it, um, but also, I'm trying to not be so redundant. Uh, originally, when I set this up, it, it was very clearly you know, separated, and now there's so much overlap. So what I've decided to do, as you can see from the screen, is I've decided to uh, lean towards more of the FEMA role for emergency, emergency preparedness and disaster response. And you know, emergency, disaster, these things are, are meant to be kind of interchangeable, though uh, emergency probably is more encompassing uh, whereas disaster tends to be more public based but that's okay because I, I think we can learn uh, from that base from the basic information here and here's the other thing too uh, if you're a safety major you're required to take safety 485 which is uh, fire prevention and control and dr. Bookman she has a lot of experience with this type of work and has a lot of experience in the healthcare industry. And so she takes it from that perspective and I think that's probably the best for safety professionals to take it. I'm going to try and tie everything together right now, both uh, from a occupational perspective and a public perspective. So let's see where this goes, shall we? And again, I'm gonna to try to keep this short. So as you can see here on the screen, what FEMA is trying to point out is like things like floods, things like uh, uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, so they have weather related, they have uh, human generated, uh, not so much, you know, a, a, an explosion at a, at, a, at a workplace or a massive release of a chemical agent, um, which would require community response. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I provided to you on the Canvas site. And, I, and the links are going to need to be explained because I'm starting to tie things into the EPA. And that would be um, the emergency response, the community emergency response should something be released. Uh, we're going to cover that when it comes to talking about uh, process safety management and hazardous waste operations and response, which is, I believe, lecture 25. Um, again, these things are so tied together, I haven't been able to parse it out the way I wanted to. One thing I, I want to go back to, and this goes all the way back to lecture 10, and that is if you're going to require workers to wear personal protective equipment, which we know is the considered the, the least preferred type of uh, control measure um, because there are so many um, variations in how it can be used. It can be used improperly, uh, not protect what it really is supposed to, uh, or you, you assume it's gonna protect and it has a, a flaw in it. So all these things. Uh, but prior to that, you're supposed to do an assessment and I tested you all on that when we did our one-on-one, uh, -on -one. there needs to be a documented assessment of what the issue is and then a matching of the selection. We had, we've had similar things like that. I mean, we're supposed to be doing continuous evaluations and then our proposed uh, mitigation or control strategies are meant to match that assessment. And if it doesn't seem correct, either we didn't do a proper assessment, we should do a, another level or a different type, or possibly the response that was selected was not sufficient or adequate than what we originally assumed. But that needs to be documented so you can continually improve. Uh, again, a, a, an effective safety program is earned over time through trial and error and uh, iterative improvements. So a disaster preparedness or an emergency preparedness, it depends on how, what direction you, you come to it. Uh, I've been in several different tabletop exercises, uh, depending on whether anything from a public health concern, a pandemic, to terrorist uh, attack, uh, to weather related. Uh, the, the, there's a wide range of things. And so uh, one thing that isn't brought up here is business continuity. And that is uh, a business not only thinking about the, you know, the, the safety of workers, the protection of the site, but if these things do occur, how does business continue? And 
companies can actually purchase uh, insurance on business continuity that if there was a particular disruption that they would be able to recover the loss in um, income the loss of sales the loss of you know whatever it is that uh, drives the company but you have to weigh whether it's worth it or not you know do we want to pay this much per year for something that has a minuscule possibility of occurring some places say yes some places say no uh, similar to what I, what I should have discussed, and I'm relating back to the last lecture with the uh, fire prevention protection, is that um, some companies bring in an insurance, uh, I guess an underwriter or an inspector, and they find that the fire suppression system is inadequate. Why would it be inadequate? Because either you change the, the storage or work that's do being done inside of the building, or you purchase it from somebody else and you're doing something different. And imagine being a safety intern and being asked, could you please, you know, update, you know, assess and update our uh, fire protection plan. And in reaching out to guest speakers and experts such as you know, Ron Wagner, uh, he provides some advice. You do your assessment and find that the fire suppression system is, is, um, is underdesigned for the work that's going on. And the recommendation is a half a million dollar upgrade. What do you think management is gonna to say to that? They're probably gonna say no, right? So, so the question you may have had from the last lecture is, well, how are these places burning down if we have all these steps in place? It's because uh, management leadership is responsible for making the decisions. We make the recommendations. We advise based on the best information possible, but they ultimately have to make that that choice, that decision. So as we move now into disaster preparing, uh, I was on YouTube and searching for things I could share with you. And probably what surprised, it didn't surprise me. What I, what I wanted to share with you, but I didn't because they're, they're very long, are um, expert panels on pandemic preparedness. And you can go and look at these. They're, they're longer though. Scientists like to, are a bit long-winded. Uh, they they had predicted this was coming. They knew what to do, but leadership felt that it wasn't a big enough concern to invest the money and time, and that's why we are where we are. I mean, that, that's you can call that opinion, but you go ahead and watch the videos and try to come up with a different response to that. So I want you to be thinking about not only business continuity and the experts can make their recommendations, but you know, what's the likelihood of these things happening? Um, and what resources or investment do you have to put in, whether it's control strategies, detection strategies, uh, redundancies, in order to prevent these things from doing damage, prevent them from happening, but if they're gonna happen anyway, such as larger, you know, weather, or terrorist attacks, well, how you can you respond to it? So this FEMA um, unit one, it addresses fire. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. We can talk about medical operations, um, uh, terrorism, things like that. So first, it's uh, you get first. You have to do a full assessment of what could possibly happen, and they should all be in individual. They all deserve their own individual considerations. Uh, so it talks about community, um, talks about people, health, infrastructure, all these things. That, you know if, if something was to go down how would you respond so one thing like hospitals have to be concerned with is if the power was to go out how can they uh, still care for patients and so therefore they have backup generators um, if communication was to go down what's a secondary and so okay so the phone lines go down the internet goes down what else do we have is cellular service still good can we use radio CB you know there's a lot of different things that can be done but you got to think ahead of how these systems we've come to rely on can fail. Um, and I think we're experiencing that right now, that in a pandemic, could we ever have predicted that we had to do self-isolation? Probably not. But as we move forward, can most citizens now consider that that's possible? Could businesses consider that as being possible and either uh, prepare for it through um, the means of insurance so that they remain in business or are there, you know, are there design changes you can make uh, 
the way you deliver your product or service to the public, can that be altered? Because a lot of, a lot of businesses are doing that right now. They're adapting, they're being resilient. Um, or is there personal protective equipment we can wear? You know, should every home have its own, you know, class B PPE, where you're wearing a Tyvek suit and you have a filtering, full face filtering face piece or possibly, uh, yeah, basically so you can protect yourself from your environment. So are these, are these things that we need to now adopt into, you know, the, the, the universe we live in? So let's keep going here. So uh, probably number one is that after you've identified what the issues are and what systems need to be maintained and you try to build in things that are backup or redundancies. But then also you have to prioritize. Key priorities as far as what do we need to uh, channel or redivert our limited resources to to ensure that they stay open, that they continue to function. And what it basically means is you're triaging. So other things are going to have to be, you know, um, shut down uh, or no longer um, or not the focus of attention so the government is responsible for setting things up for for national for national or regional disasters and how they're going to respond to it and people complain oh i don't want to pay taxes for all these things that we never use um the thing is yeah w but when the emergency presents itself you're so glad it's there and so I wish we had, I, I hope after or at some point we have this national discussion that um, what's the likelihood of, you know, a uh, massive weather event, a massive terrorist attack or, or invasion, um, pandemics, um, all these things that could possibly disrupt our everyday lives like this, this pandemic has. And what do we need to put in place? What's the, we all need to have the same understanding of how it can affect life. And it may affect some and not others. And so for those not being affected by it, they should still want to support those that are being affected by it. And I'm not trying to speak from a socialism or communism perspective here. It's, this is a public health, public safety response that just because it's affecting others doesn't mean that you may have to give something up so that they can somehow try to build back or uh, survive whatever they're going through. So when it comes to a response, uh, <laughs> it tends to be very hierarchical that you have, you should have the decision maker or decision makers uh, uh, proximally lo localized or in constant communication. And then there are levels that go out that are responding and feeding information back. And that information is meant to help with decision making. You know, um, where resources are going, uh, changing of conditions, therefore changing of response or standard operating procedures. And in here it even talks about, you know, search and rescue, things like that. Uh, but you have to be able to mobilize. Uh, both people and resources and messages. Um, so community preparedness. We tend to over rely that the government is taking care of it. There should be more of a sit. I mean, you go to a workplace and for you do fire drills together. Uh, we, we test our, you know, our tornado alarm like the first Wednesday at noon um, every month. Uh, they test our radio and TV for the emergency broadcasting system. On our phones, we get we can get weather alerts, amber alerts, silver alerts, things like that. But I don't think we I think we need more of a community type involvement. I, I mean, that's one reason why we're so you know deaf, deaf, blind, and dumb when it comes to the response to this pandemic. Um, we just, there's, there's too much information being thrown, too many opinions. You know, if, if we were all on the same team and we knew our individual responsibilities and knew when we had to dis support others as well, we'd be in a much better place. And I'm not trying to speak here from an opinion or a political uh, pulpit here. It's, that's how you respond to emergencies. Um, and it's not going too well right now. So it talks about the public, how we need to inform, educate, 
provide resources. Also, the public can become a source of information, and we and we should have that. We need to know what's really going on, um, how people are are uh, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're feeling, what their needs are, uh, and how they're helping others. So then we can support that as well. Um, so it talks about this citizens' core, and that, that's a good thing. So it's probably a citizen-based response. In addition to that, um, do any of you live near a chemical plant or a petroleum processing plant? Do you know how the community would respond? Should there be a release or an explosion or a fire? Um, and I provided a video of West Texas, uh, a disaster. Fertilizer plant exploded and damaged a good part of the town. Um, there were misinterpretation and of, of rules. Uh, of safety guidelines and the community paid the price for that one um, it's just uh, people either underestimating or not fully appreciating the risk of uh, things like that so types of disasters here natural technological intentional and I believe what they mean is I think that that, ex that building that's half destroyed there may be the Oklahoma City bombing, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, on the right, they've got the cooling towers for a nuclear power plant. Um, and, you know, we've, we had Chernobyl, we had Three Mile Island, we had uh, the, uh, the, the one that was uh, damaged by the tsunami in Japan, uh, Fukasaki, I think, or I may be saying that wrong, I apologize. Natural disasters, whether that's a hurricane, whether that's um, tornado, earthquake, there's a lot of different things that can affect and actually, you know, break down the basic uh, public safety response. Um, interestingly, a case study back, you know, in the early 2000s was the uh, the New Orleans um, when the uh, the the uh, the water uh, what they call them dikes or whatever broke and flooded the city. I had attended a uh, a city emergency response tour, and they had predicted things like this from happening. But what they didn't predict was the uh, number of people who were going to survive it, because if a hurricane hit and pushed you know the 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 storm surge up over. The, uh, the walls and flooded the city, they expected, you know, any magnitude of, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 people would, would perish. But this didn't. And so now they had 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people needing assistance. And you kind of saw what happened there. They, they misinterpreted what could have happened. Uh, emergency personnel may be overwhelmed, indeed. So part of the response should be the mental health the overall health of the responders. Um, I know that for the Oklahoma City bombing, they were using uh, dogs to try and find survivors in the rubble. And because they were basically only finding um, cadavers, the dogs were actually getting um, depressed. And so at the end of every shift, when, when they weren't finding anybody, they would have a, another person, a live person hide so that the dog could find it and that made the dogs feel better. That's a true story. Uh, so this is talking a little about local hazard vulnerability. So there may be areas that are more vulnerable than others. I don't know if you're a homeowner yet or not, but um, I like to my home to be a little bit higher up, but not so high up that it, it could be exposed to a lightning strike. So where does water flow? It flows downhill. So I'd rather be out of a floodplain, but not at the top of a hill that could hit by lightning or be exposed to um, sheer winds interestingly enough and it's also you know you can also look back at uh, tornado paths we're in the Midwest so that's our major concern tornado paths it, it seems like there are some places that tornadoes never really hit yet there are other places they are hit and and so it's both a topography and um, just a, the way certain weather patterns work that I've seen. I've seen this in Minnesota and I've seen it in Wisconsin. There are some cities that always get hit and it's just there seems to be a, a focal of, of, of negative weather 
Um, up in Minnesota, if you were to take where Lake Superior you know, hits Duluth and Superior, if you extended a line down, there seems to be a point that is a natural weather changer. Where in the Twin Cities, it can be really nice or whatever, you drive up and as soon as you cross that barrier, it's like the weather changes, the temperature changes. And they've actually studied those types of things. So as you look to where you wanna live, it's a good idea to kind of look at that kind of stuff. And yeah, you know, when you buy home insurance too, you may find it as well because they know where the uh, where homes are most likely to get hit by, you know, high winds, hail, things like that. They have to pay more. Here is the results of damage infrastructure. Please, firefighters, EMS. Uh, you got to look and see what kind of um, hazards are are related to structural type. You want to try to keep the uh, and then also certain areas should have um, building codes in order to match what the potential could be. And then when people start violating those building codes, that's when structures go down. Ah, look at disruption of things like gas, electricity, things like that, potential for fire. Talks a little bit about home and workplace preparedness. I think we have talked about this, you know, communication systems, electricity, um, or at least uh, electricity sources. You know, should you have a generator? Is that is that what is needed? Or do you have a place you can go should power go out? So I guess having, you know, family and friends within a driving distance is always good, but our road's gonna be in, in a proper condition. Uh, there are protective actions as well. I think yeah, you can, you're probably already reading these, so what you can do. I think the average homeowner doesn't have um, the ability to protect themselves should they have to venture out in um, hazardous air um, or be able to treat water at home, things like that. I think it'd be good if we did things like that, just so the general public understands it. Whether we're in a shelter in place, whether there's retreat, whether there is a place where people are gonna meet that are safe, that's safer. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the basic person thinks about these things. And I, I know that, um, I'm going a little bit long here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed it up that, uh, you know, should you have to leave your home because of an emergency, how long would it take you to gather up the things you really need? Um, something to think about. And I, I know once in a while the CDC will put out uh, articles and sometimes you'll see it on the news. Do you have a, um, a bag prepared? Uh, a flea bag, uh, not a flea bag. <laughs> uh, a, a leave bag or something like that. Uh, in California, they have to think about things because of the wildfires. Um, you know, the, the fire is all of a sudden coming. You gotta retreat where people wanna stay and fight. Uh, hurricane, now nah, that, that takes a while. Escape planning, prepared for disaster, non-structural mitigation. So these are more things at the home, and I want to cover those. Uh, so uh, building st a structure, support, you know, things that are being secured, uh, fortifying your home, getting involved is probably the most important. But there needs to be leadership. If your community is not gonna lead stuff like this, then it's not gonna happen. It's, it's difficult to do it individually. Yes, I've taken steps uh, for myself and for my family. Should something happen that we could respond? These are things that I do think about and things I've put in place. I'm not all the way there. Um, but uh, so far we've been, we've been okay. So here's the basic organization. I talked about it before things you should have at your disposal. Do I have all these things? Yeah, I do have all these things available uh, to me downstairs. And uh, do I have fire extinguishers at home? I do. Do I have, do I have an interconnected um, uh, gas or fire detection system? I do. Do we test it regularly? Yes, we do. So non-disaster roles. Yeah, so this is when the community has prepared it and you've got citizen groups. Uh, should we be helping? We should. Additional training is available. Here's the summary. So I just wanted to show, quickly show you what I have here. I hope I covered, without really addressing the specifics, I'm trying to give you an overall feel. As citizens, we should be more involved. We should be going through drills and training. There should be more of a greater discussion of this stuff. Um, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I hope that if anything, this pandemic um, forces that discussion and forces more involvement. Um, it, we're just all better if we're prepared. And I think that we make better choices on a daily basis. 
um, to be more aware, to be more helpful, to be more prepared. So uh, I've got links to OSHA's Emergency Preparedness and Response. They've got an e-tool as well. These are more along the lines of fire, but terrorism is also an issue. But before I get to that, so we've got OSHA's Emergency Preparedness handout, uh, Principal Emergency Preparedness and Response, EPA's EPCRA. So this is if, you, if your uh, workplace has a chemical agent of ab above a certain quantity, you're required to inform the local emergency um, authorities, typically um, uh, county public health and fire, and then you work out a plan. Should there be a release? Should there be an explosion? What's the community response? They need to know that kind of stuff. Uh, then uh, I, I'm referring back to the Chemical Safety Board. They've got a good response for emergency. Uh, also, a, their investigation of the West Texas fertilizer explosion. Then when we get to terrorism, there's, there's this thing called Run, Hide, Fight. Um, and I also gave a, a link to the people who do training for active shooter. Um, so violence in the workplace is an issue, and it's one of those things that companies should prepare for. And so Run, Hide, Fight... It's just it is, it's a good video that a lot of people uh, in companies use to train their workers and prepare for um, should someone show up um, and be attempt to um, shoot people. So that's all I got. So I could go on and on and on in different directions, but I wanted to give something that's more relatable, especially to what we're dealing with um, today. So I'm going to go into flammable liquids and then ventilation, which is a very important topic, and then we get into process safety management and hazardous waste operations and response.